the tarot is the star tonight. We have Jenny Pearlstein with us here. She's going to talk to you tonight about two things that are very important to us over here at Psychic Viewpoint. The tarot and trauma, all the bad stuff. Uh, the tarot is mysterious, powerful, life-changing. Trauma is just an ugly fact of life. But we hope tonight that by exploring the darker side of fate, that we'll accidentally find what it is we've been looking for all along, joy, peace, and comfort. So if you ever read tarot for yourself or your family or your friends, this show is for you. Jenny Pearlstein is about to teach you how to recognize pain in the tarot and happiness and achievement in the tarot. You can find out more about Jenny at tarotastrocounseling.com.au. A-U. And I do believe we have Jenny with us tonight. Hi, Jenny. How are you? Good. I'm very well, thank you. It's good morning oh. for me. Good oh, evening good to morning. you. That's right. That's right. You're over there in Australia. Well, good morning to you. Well, well let's go ahead and, and get started here. You are a therapist, a licensed therapist with a bunch of academic uh, titles and degrees after your name. <laughs> really too, too many to mention here. There's just so many. So you're highly <laughs> educated and also a tarotist. So let's talk about the Major Arcana for a bit. Can you just tell us a little bit about some Major Arcana cards that you find cause some problems maybe with your clients or in general? Um, yes. The, I think that uh, there's, a, there's a difference between what's a problem for the reader and what's a problem for the client when they see the cards come up. In fact, I was at a, a tarot con convention here in Melbourne at the weekend and as soon as the teacher mentioned, oh yes, the client's reaction to the death card or the devil, the whole audience, we all just went, yes, we know. <laughs> <laughs> um, clients so often see those cards and um, and jump ahead, you know, thinking, oh, it's going to be disastrous and so on. And uh, I think that that they're often challenges for the reader and the client. Uh, but uh, I think that, um, you know, the key things there, of course, are to say to people that it, it needs, it depends on the question, it depends on the context, it depends on the type of reading you're doing, um, but getting the client to see that as you will say, you know, it's okay, we get to that and uh, reassure them. And, uh, and I often very simply say, look, death is about transformation, and yes, there might be some pain, there might be some grief and loss, and this may be the picking up on something that they've been through, going through, or a situation that might develop that way. And um, I really try to get across to them that it's um, a way of, of cleansing out themselves and their life and uh, letting go of some things that might uh, be challenging to them and that the devil card really is all about fear and by facing the illusion of that fear um, you can often confront uh, what's really holding you back and what's a deep challenge for you on that level. Um, often, I, you know, I think for many of us, the devil can represent things that are addictive, which can include, I think a lot of people don't recognise that, you know, relationships can be addictive, codependency. Um, it's not just your alcohol and drugs, it's food, it's... Um, addiction to being just with other people that you can't cope with being alone there's a whole range of, of aspects so um, I try to reassure people but it's also then um, trying to get across to them too that um, they have some resources within and often the card can pick up on that and you know for example the death card I'll go into the actual characters on the card and and say how is each person responding you know, to the the approaching um, death or change that might be occurring, and we explore that further. Ah. So that uh, oh, most of the time, people you can see the relief on their face <laughs> as I as I explain yeah. that, and they relax and and whilst they still need to, you know, it's not trying to take away that it's all um, lovely and and fluffy. Um, it's trying to get across to them, yeah, there are challenges and there might be pain and, and you're not going to change within unless you do have pain. Uh, right. But it's something they can cope with. They have the resources within to cope with. Well, you know, let's say that I'm 
doing a reading for a coworker. We're probably going to use the coworker a lot because I think that might be a general situation that people might yes, use, maybe yes, a novice yes. might use. And yes. uh, a whole, there are a whole bunch of court cards in this. Let's say the coworker asked me perhaps a relationship question I, or, or even a question about their career. Uh, and there are a bunch of court cards in the spread. Though these can be confusing. How, how would you approach these, all those court cards? Yeah, people often get challenged by the court cards. Um, it's strange because I suppose I've never found them to be such a great challenge. Um, my approach to them is, um, as always, um, it's, it's looking at them. For, you, you need to look at the overview of the of the reading. You know what cards are there? What's the question? What's the pers- What's the question the person's asking? And and just even just initially seeing how many court cards there might be, and if there's quite a few, then that often can represent that. Uh, both it could be something within the person themselves the the oh. the the, uh, the asker or the reader the client the, sorry the the person asking the questions or the client um, but it could also mean an another person um, but I suppose because I'm a tarot counselor um, I'm very aware of things like projection so that for example say the king of wands comes up and uh, you're you're talking to a work colleague and they're, but they're asking about relationship and you might say um, uh, this uh, this is a person with charm and and who's uh, assured of themselves and is very visionary um, courageous and so on and sometimes that can can represent and they go oh yeah i think that describes the person i'm quite interested in mm-hmm. and and then i try to reflect it back to the person and say but what is it within you that is like that mm-hmm. and what are you projecting out onto this person that you know you're you are feeling attracted to? So that's just an example of how I might work with the court cards. But I do sometimes use them as very literal. You know, if they say that, if I say, is there a person that has these characteristics that's around in your life? And sometimes they'll say, no, not that I'm aware of. Well, then I focus on what's within the person themselves. So that's the way I tend to. Um, work with the court cards and it can and I don't stick depending on the, the context of the reading and what's going on there sure. I will sometimes switch between it can be both things it could represent an outer person and an aspect of the person within themselves so just to be clear here you have sort of like a twin approach the the mm, court card mm. could represent an actual player or an actor in this drama, but it, yes. it could also be a part of myself that I wish that I had or that I hate about myself and that I'm putting out on other people. Yes, that's right. Also, Absolutely. And, and, and yeah, you're also yeah. saying that you, 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 you freely go between these two applications in the to see which one makes the most sense and apply it Sense, yes. Yeah, because I ah. approached um, my readings very much as a dialogue with the client. And, right. we're, and, and I don't have absolutely all the answers. So sometimes if we're both really stuck, I will say, um, you know, wh- when you look at this card, what comes up for you? And, uh, and by sometimes exploring it that way too and yes. noticing what's in the card because some of the cards can have some details that um, uh, can really speak to a person and may inform the situation. You know, how the person, particularly in the court card, how they're dressed, what direction they're looking um, you know, even you know, some of the court cards, the person, uh, the character is looking away. So the person, the client may interpret that as, yes, I really like them, but they just don't seem interested in me. Sure. Um, and that can that, be another way to work with them. Uh, that's that's very a very clear way of handling what's always been kind of a, a, a very cloudy uh, subject mm. in, in the tarot, for sure. Now, as as we went over, as I said, a lot of us are going to be reading for our family and our friends. And, you know, you are a, a therapist, a counselor, and this is something different from the tarot. So are there any, like, just rough, broad sort of guidelines to help us out in just dealing with this our loved one or maybe even a client in a way that's the most effective? Yes, I think that, that certainly there's a bit of a difference between working with 
people that you know, family, friends, and those, you know, if you're sitting in a market or you have people coming to your office or wherever you work from um, and who you know nothing about. I think, though, the same principles apply that you need to set very clear boundaries. And I think particularly with family and friends and with general clients, confidentiality, saying, look, what we talk about stays here. Um, uh, if some of you, uh, the audience might be, I don't know, old enough to remember Get Smart and the cone of <laughs> silence. <laughs> and I, I sometimes that. use that um, imagery. I say, right, we are bringing down the cone of silence and <laughs> what goes on between us stays here. And, and particularly when you're working with family and friends, that's extremely important because they might be worried you're going to go off and, you know, talk to someone or hint at something. And I'm very careful with that myself if I get a friend or family member and I just say, look, I just, it's like I forget everything we've talked about after the reading. So don't worry. Um, it's its confidential. Um, there are some areas that, that can be difficult. I think this is the caution I would say, yes, whilst it's great for practising with family and friends, there are sometimes areas where you go, you feel in yourself, oh, I don't want to go there. I don't want to ask about that issue. You know, it's their, right. you know, their relationship with my uncle or <laughs> whoever right. it is. So, so sometimes I think it's important to just what I use there is immediacy and go, look, I know you've got issues. What's coming up here? There are issues in your relationship with your husband, you know, and that's my uncle. And I think it's better maybe we don't talk about that. Uh wow. Yeah, you know, set some boundaries or say to the person, ask them, look, I know this is a, a difficult issue for you and I know a little bit about it, but I don't know the full picture and it's up to you whether you want to reveal those things to me. So always put it back to the client. Give them a sense of empowerment and control. Some, If it's a cl someone in your family or friends, they may go, yeah, we're probably better to leave that or no, I'm happy for you to know more detail. So... That's important. But you can use those same uh, principles with anybody you're doing a reading for. Beautiful, beautiful. I, it's one thing you really bring bring up here. I like how you emphasize that this is a mutual investigation where you yes. are the detective and also the uh, asker, the seeker, is also the detective. And that sort of leads me to my next question because the way you're doing tarot is effective. This isn't a parlor trick. So uh, let's suppose you're observing me giving my giving an asker a, a tarot reading maybe it's a friend maybe mm -hmm. it's a client who knows now suppose the tarot leads us to a brutal truth for that poor asker the asker doesn't want to hear it it's something that the asker she may have assumed that she knew everything about already but the tarot hits her with something contrary to her assumptions shocks her now let's imagine you could step in at that moment what would you say to me to help me be the most effective and to serve this asker's best interests and what might you say to the asker? Okay. Well, what I would say is it's okay to pause. And if something that is a, a shock to the client comes up, to just take a breath, pause, and allow that, uh, that new knowledge, that impact to sit with, with the client. And that it's okay for you just to stop and observe um, the person. Because I think that, you know, those sort of shocks, different people react differently and you need a little bit of time to both allow for that to sink in for the client but also for you as the asker, uh, sorry, as the, as the reader to observe what's happening for the client. How, you know, body language, communication, ver words are only 7% of communication. Most communication is body language and, and tone and pitch of voice. And I'm sure we've all experienced it where you can just see the facial expression on a client change, even a tear come to the eye and the, the colour drain out of the person's face. That is telling you so much. It really is a shock. They are really emotionally challenged by this. So it's important that you mirror that. You sit back and, and just respect what they're feeling. And then as it maybe penetrates to say to them, gee, I've just noticed that's really 
uh, been a surprise to you or I can see that's shocked you or you feel, you're looking pretty um, sad at, at about that information. So be immediate but also empath- empathic and so step into their shoes and pick up as best you can what they're feeling. And that's really in a sense your – because I see a reading as both like a seesaw moving between the cards and counselling. So it's this sort of seesaw depending on what's happening for that particular client. And um, in that moment, you know, I would be sitting back from the cards, not focusing on the cards, sitting back and really focusing on the person. And then uh, offering that empathy and from that, often then the person, when, when you've empathised with them and said, wow, that's been a shock for you, they will often go, yeah, I really, you know, hadn't realised this was going on or that truth about myself or whatever the situation is. And then that will open up the dialogue. But it's also important to assess how distressed the person is because we also need a degree of um, what I call ego strength. We need our own inner container to cope. And I've had clients who, where they've been uh, distressed with something and, and I have assessed that they're just so fragile, so vulnerable that I focused on very much being supportive um, and focusing on positives and sometimes moving right away from what the cards are saying and really just being with the person and exploring what's happening for them and maybe even considering um, further referral or su- ongoing support for them. Now, very interesting. Now, so we talked about one end of the seesaw, how I, I should handle this situation. Okay, well, do you have any any words of advice for someone who... Uh, is maybe confronted with something that is shocking like that, something that that maybe challenges them to think about their entire self-definition with an open mind. Do you have any tips for that person who's been led to this shock by the tarot? Yeah, I think, um, again, acknowledging and being immediate and saying that has been huge for you. I can see that that's uh, really impacted upon you. And, And asking very general questions like, how is that making you feel? Um, what's your sense of, of where this might go next for you? Um, how is this uh, changing um, your perspective on this situation? And really allowing the person to sit with it and express how they feel and letting that flow. I think the important thing is giving that person space to express how they feel. And if, and if they're sitting there looking shocked and in silence and you can see they're processing it, that's fine. If they start talking, um, just continuing to mirror and empathise. It also, as I said, may lead to um, then where the person is very distressed and then saying to them, look, this is obviously a pretty big situation for you and challenging. Um, how would you feel if we explore what other supports you might be able to um, access um, whether that's, you know, and I say to people, look, I'm not trying to get more money out of you or anything, but if you need to come back and see me again or uh, saying to them, what's your plan after you leave here today? What's what's the next steps for you? And they might say, oh, I'm going back to work or I'm going home um, and I'll, I'll try to gauge you know, what other support they have in their life. Is there a friend, a family member they can speak to? And then we may talk about an actual referral to ongoing further counselling, um, if it's a more medical health issue, seeing their doctor, etc. And making sure they might, for example, if it's really a crisis situation, um, I may even with them uh, go online or look at my own resources to say refer them to um, other supports. Um, it could be anything from you know, domestic violence supports to uh, more specialised uh, counselling, depending on what the issue is. I might add also that you are peculiarly qualified to do precisely this, licensed by the authorities in your area. And so you remind me, if you don't mind me observing this, sort of of, of, of like Father Karras 
Father Karras from uh, the novel The Exorcist, who on the one hand, he's a priest, but on the other hand, he's also a physician. And while mm-hmm. he's attending to Reagan, he's also noticing things like her heart rate and, uh, and things like that. Um, but yes. again, you're also a tarot reader. And every tarot reader, yes. I asked him this question, and you've come all this way from tarotastrocounseling.com.au, so I have to ask you. Do you use reverse cards or do you tend to ignore them? I don't use them. Um, it, it's really quite a, an interesting topic because there are some very um, knowledgeable and experienced uh, readers that I respect who do and many others who don't. My teacher, Ann Chodder, who was, I, I got taught the tarot cards many years ago, but who's a very respected uh reader and teacher in Australia, she didn't, doesn't use reverse cards. And I tend to go along with that because I think the cards each are complex enough in their own selves. Um, they have so many uh, levels that you can interpret the literal level uh, right through to the more esoteric and spiritual levels. And they are, um, I don't really like to use, you know, positive and negative. It's a bit too dualistic. But um, in that sense, that each card has both its positive and negative or, uh, you know, more, um, I suppose, life-affirming and challenging aspects. And there's enough meaning and complexity and depth in each card without adding reversals to it. That makes sense. The tarot has a way of saying the same thing with the cards already right oriented the right way up. So why make it more complex? That makes sense. Um, yep. Well, that, that, that sort of um, leads me to my next question here. Uh, do you have a particular favorite tarot card? Or maybe is there one that sort of leaps out at you, one that you can relate to more than another? I hate, I hate to ask um, you to, to play favorites here, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. I think I, look. I think that's very valid. I think every person, um, you know, the cards are so visual and so full of myth and archetypes and symbols that, of course, you feel drawn. Uh, I, I particularly feel drawn to the star. Um, that uh, it just gives such a sense of hope and peace. And is so centering and calming. Um, you can be in a most angst-filled situation and meditate and look at that card, and it can already you just feel the spirit flowing through you and um, calming you, and able to give you some sort of sense of clarity in that whatever situation you're in has a purpose and a meaning. Um, in whatever life is throwing at you at that time. So that's probably uh, my, my favorite card. Yeah, I have to admit, I love that one too. That's, that's, a, that's a definite green flag sort of card for me. When mm-hmm. I see that, then I, I tend to think that things are going to turn out well, which sort of brings us to our next part of this interview here. I'd like to talk about some red flags and some green flags for some common um, questions that people might have and obviously probably get a lot of relationship questions for family business partnerships romantic partnerships so when you do a spread for a relationship type of a question what sorts of green flags and do you hope to see and what sort of red flags do you hope not to see (laughs) (laughs) uh yeah well i think we all go oh (laughs) <laughs> which, which is, um, I have to do a little bit of promotion here because one of the things that uh, I've done is a specific masterclass, um, the secret ingredients of uh, relationship readings. And uh, that's on, um, I, I think I've sent you the link on Global Spiritual Studies where I have a lot of my courses online because I do a whole, uh, huge, a large course on counselling and mental health skills as well as shorter courses on secret ingredients to relationship readings, difficult clients um, and uh, and other topics that I've got there. So, But on that question of relationships, uh, what I like to see uh, I think is um, first of all, generally I suppose the more positive cards if we can use those terms so that where there's 
cards that are indicating flow and openness and that might be the star, it might um, be the magician, um, there might be, uh, you know, the nine of pentacles, these sort of cards that have a sense of, of openness and some stability and, uh, yes, that... Um, have lots of pictures of gardens and things in them. So if you're using those very just visual symbols and then drilling down, of course we like to see um, the four of wands, uh, the two of wands, the um, not so much the two of wands, sorry, but the, the four of wands, the partnership. Um, we also might like to, the lovers, you know, that. but sometimes the lovers, I mm, that's one of those ones where you initially go, oh, yeah, that's, very positive and <laughs> looks great for a relationship, right. but it is also has a, and a deeper level of having to make a choice and having to, you know, really work hard at integration. So it can represent also a challenge in really deepening that relationship. So there's some of the cards that might come up that I go, oh, yes, or you get, say, the Empress and the Emperor together. Um, those sort of cards, you might go, yes, oh, that, that bodes well. Uh, but some, yeah, as, as uh, the, the other cards that are more uh, problematic, more challenging, particularly if the devil comes up, um, I, I'm always concerned about, a real, it's either um, a one-sided relationship um, or a tendency for codependence. And the way I term codependence is where you have, rather than an adult-to-adult -adult relationship, you have a parent-child relationship going on um, where one person acts like the parent and the other one's like the dependent child. And sometimes that switches around, uh, but it's not balanced. So, so any cards that indicate not having a, a balance um, in relation to relationship questions um, can indicate some mm, some challenges and some problems. Yes, I noticed that with a lot of the sort of green flag cards that you mentioned, a lot of them, like you said, they have green stuff on them, symbols for fertility. <laughs> You know, yes. And, yes, and and cards like the Devil card, it's going to really be hard to find green stuff in them. There's not that much fertility in a relationship where there's like some sort of addiction going on. You, I think you mentioned that term in connection with mm. the Devil card as well, addiction, yes. and yep. and things of that nature. So, I would imagine if you're doing, if you're at home doing a relationship question for your friend or family member, and you see cards with a bunch of flowers and green stuff in them, then that's 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 a fairly clear indication that we can expect something nice here. Yes, you know, am I on the right yes. track with this? Yeah, generally. I mean, I think again, it depends on um, the balance of the cards that you have, the elements, and. Um, and specifically, as we've mentioned, you know, there's a few cards that indicate more the the love or, or relationship or something new happening. It may be as simple as the the Page of Cups, for example, um, or you, the the Empress uh, may come up. Um, there's, uh, you know, the, the even it depends. It's also, I think it's very important with all the things we're talking about, it really depends on the question that the person is asking. Right. And I think where uh, the more specific the question, um, the better. So that really defining the question, and sometimes I work with the client extensively to help them define the question. They might say, oh, I just want to know about my, re my love life, relationship life. And I, I'll try to drill that down and get them to be more specific. Um, are they looking for someone? Are they in a relationship? Um, and, and getting them to um, be more detailed about what they're wanting. So that then when the card, particular cards do come up, then I can respond more specifically and, and let them know what I'm interpreting as, um, uh, you know, as the direction that things might be happening. Very interesting. So your way of doing tarot in therapy is you ask, the, you ask the seeker to shoulder some responsibility to think a bit about what it is she or he wants. To really think Absolutely. about defining what they want Absolutely. out of the situation. You want and also what they might need to do. And many times I see people who, um, some people don't want to engage in this process and I go with that by being a bit more, I suppose, literal and concrete. But others, um, you can see them going, they'll say, 
Yeah, I know I need to do that. Yes, I've been thinking that I need to talk to that person or yes, I know I need to leave them um, or whatever the confronting situation might be. And they've really been hoping that the reading will say, oh, no, it'll all work out and you don't need to do anything. <laughs> uh, right. But many times the reading reflects back what's in the person's unconscious. And so I've had many clients say to me, so their, their body language, they wriggle and they look down and they go, yeah, I know I need to do that. <laughs> I've just been ho uh, avoiding uh, confronting that. And the cards will speak the truth for that person. Um, I, I, I see myself and I think many readers do as really the conduit for um, what is coming from the person. And to a degree, you know, I, I at times do feel spirit or however you want to term it, um, coming through me where there's a sense of intuitively and um, the higher universe wisdom saying, no, this is the particular interpretation for this client or this is what they need to hear um, or see. Very good. Yep. Well, you know, we're going to take it. We're going to pause now and take a quick break. Sure. We'll be back in one minute. I just want to remind everyone that the, the tips and tricks we're learning here are just skimming the surface. We don't have anywhere nearly. Uh, we don't have anywhere near enough time to get into the nuts and bolts of these matters. So, if you're interested in learning that, go to globalspiritualstudies.com/tarot/jennypearlstein, and you'll find a, a, a detailed list of her courses, and you can learn some of the secrets to interpreting the tarot. Uh, Jenny, you mentioned the devil card before, and and yes. you mentioned addiction in connection with that. And I, I, you know, I hate to say it, but one thing that just leapt to my mind was sort of masochism, being addicted to always being the one who's suffering in a relationship. Do you ever do you encounter people like that who need uh, to be the one who gets hurt in a relationship? And, and could many, the devil represent that? Yeah, many times I, I see that. I think that. The devil um, is often an indicator of that. Uh, if there's a lot of um, cards, uh, cup, uh, cups cards in the spread, um, maybe the moon is also, uh, the moon is often an indicator of just such confusion and deep unconscious issues. It has huge potential um, in that circumstance where someone, uh, you know, feels like they're the victim or has to be always the one on the receiving end of the pain, as in masochism. Um that I think that uh, what's important there is is for the person to, I really try to gently get them to see that, you know, you are worth more than that, um, that there's um, complexities here unconsciously that uh, you're grappling with, that and I particularly some of the key questions I ask are some of the patterns in people's relationships. And by asking them, so, you know, what's been your relationship history and um, who was the, you know, what were those relationships like? Were they balanced? Uh, who ended the relationship? You can, in a very f course of a few minutes, just get a really good picture. And many times people will come out with a pattern of, oh, yes, I was the one who was hurt or they, you know, they um, took all my money off me or, yes, they used to even um, be violent towards them or they were controlling and possessive. A whole range of different dynamics that might come out. But where I always have that, transactional analysis framework in my mind of the parent-child where um, they have been like the wounded, damaged child in that relationship and the parent, the other person, uh, really being the controlling um, or um, abusive one. And the key with this, and this is where having um, either a, a background as a counsellor or training in um, these sort of areas, which I've got, um, is to look at the issues. All, all adult relationship issues come from your upbringing. And that's the truth that often people don't want to see or hear, but that's the reality. And particularly from, um, from when you're born till you're three years old and even um, in utero, the uh, family environment that you're in and grow up in, and that's the time when your your brain is imprinted with those sorts of dynamics and issues that are going on, both between your parents and, and from your parents towards you, and where there can be lots of um, difficulties with attachment issues to usually the mum, um, but whoever the caring adult is. 
And so, it, and people then I say, well, you know, how was your upbringing, your relationship with your parents and get a general picture. And often when someone is uh, having a pattern of being the victim or the on the uh, masochistic end of relationships, there's often been a pattern of family dysfunction, um, abuse. And I use that very broadly um, because that often includes emotional and psychological abuse. And I have many people say to me, oh, no, I had a good upbringing. And then I ask a few more detailed questions and you find out, oh, no, dad was really dominating. Mum was really passive. Um, and then you can see the, the story unfolding of where they had that sort of dynamic model to them. Because adult relationships are really trying to seek what you didn't get as a child or to reenact what you had as a child with your parents and uh, unconsciously a part of you is trying to fix it, make it better. Uh, maybe this time the person will love me. So um, where there's a real pattern of someone trying to seek uh, love from another person to try and heal their inner wounds from their childhood and I try to draw that out in a reading, then um, that's when you can really start to say, hey, you know, this is not balanced and you are worth more than that and I would be suggesting that you have further, deeper ongoing therapy about this. Some clients want to hear it and some don't, but many do and I think, I'm draw I think the clients that come to me are particularly drawn to that uh, you know, un uh, instinctively they sort of know that that's the way I operate and what I look at. And that can be very challenging and um, hard for the person. But ultimately, it's the only way to get to the point of having healthier adult relationships. Ah, makes sense. So those that's the, the devil card would be certainly a red flag that could lead to that a sort of oh. more serious type of progress. Now, we're going to yes. go ahead and take this opportunity to get to, to uh, do our commercial and we will be back in one minute's time a new era in psychic services has begun psychicaccess.com you can connect with our psychic advisors by telephone or chat 24 hours a day seven days a week all of our psychic advisors are interviewed fully verified and accuracy tested assuring you quality service we're living in some very troubled times right now. More and more, the world's problems are affecting us on a personal level. You don't have to deal with this alone. Our highly accurate psychics, caring advisors and talented mediums can help with situations you are currently experiencing and can let you know what the future may hold for you. All new customers get a free six-minute reading. All you have to do is register. Why not visit us now and get a free reading at psychicaccess.com? All right, you're listening to The Psychic Viewpoint with Ginny Perlstein. Uh, we were just talking about love, and we found some red flags, some green flags. But now let's turn to another area, very important to people. Uh, sometimes the people who seek us out, Ginny, are really depressed. They're having trouble focusing on their work. They don't have their appetite, losing their appetite. They're really stressed out. So when they come to you, do you notice sometimes maybe some repeats or trouble types of cards that might pop out for them I and mean, what are you looking out for with these sorts of clients yes uh, again a lot of the same principles apply that I've, I've mentioned already of, of really placing the client at the center of of the of the reading and uh, I have certainly have had readings where I can tell even just the person sitting there and when they're starting to speak and they're just sounding so flat and unhappy and they're looking like that in their body language and sounding like it, um, that then the cards come up that may represent a lot of struggles and, and challenges. So, And I know some of the obvious ones are going to be things like um, maybe, the, maybe the devil. But I also think, as I mentioned before, the moon often signifies very deep unconscious issues. Yeah. Um, uh, there might be um, even the Seven of Swords, the Three of Swords, you know, a lot of past sorrow. Um, uh, the Six of Swords where people uh, might be grappling with grief. Um, the, um, uh, the Five of Cups, you know, also very typically grief card. So, so these are the sort of ones that might appear. Um, the six of cups can also be quite significant in that it's um, one of those. That's a 
one of those challenging ones in the minor arcana because I think that it has a lot of mystical aspects to it. But on a very literal level, it it has a sense of which um, it looks like you know a couple of children playing in a in a in the yard of a house. You know, or, it is sweet, and then, isn't it? Sorry, it is. It's sweet, isn't it? Yes, it's initially, but when you start to look at it more closely, it depends on the deck you use. But in the right of weight, you'll see the cracks in the buildings, and that um, there's an adult there, but they're walking away, and um, you know the the clothing is a bit bedraggled, and you know it, it's not right. a, it, as it appears. So that it it often relates to past issues, and so if that may come up in for someone who's uh, is quite depressed and, and overwhelmed with life. So um, it depends on the on the combination again, but. Um, it may uh, the ten of wands might come up where someone's just so overloaded with so many worries and so many problems, or nine of wands where they're just feeling embattled, um, and uh, feel like they they can't go on. Or the eight of swords is a, is also a quite a significant one where the person feels very stuck and uh, and can't move out of the situation. So um, there could be various cards that might come up, and and then I really try to. Gently and sensitively work with the client, getting a sense of actually how despairing they're feeling because I think that's important. I don't want to overload them. If I sense that they are really um, overwhelmed, I can remember having one client who it came out in the reading that she was quite depressed and had a whole lot of things happen to her. I moved right away from the cards actually because I could sense that she was just so vulnerable and so fragile because the cards were looking incredibly challenging and quite negative and I didn't want to load her with anything more um, in her life and so we then talked about her uh, referring herself, going to her doctor, getting a referral to see a psychologist, potentially looking at antidepressant medication and so on. So, um, you know, I think you've really always got to assess the person in front of you primarily. Interesting. You mentioned a lot of swords cards in there. Mm. What is it with mm. that element that makes it so difficult for people? Yes, because so often their thinking is what's also um, affecting them emotionally and ingrained beliefs. It's not just, you know, we could, we all think things that are a bit negative or pessimistic, you know, oh, I'm not going to get through this work today or um, I've got too much on my plate. But when you start to get into deeper beliefs like I'm no good or I'm not worthy, um, you know, my life is is, is, is full of crap, Um all of that sort of thing or I'm guilty about something. And often those beliefs are so deeply ingrained that you're not even conscious of them. And that's where I think the real risk of depression or deep anxiety, et cetera, can, um, uh, can emerge. Well, we're actually moving into the final part of our interview here. And I'd like to ask you a few questions or about your about tarot spreads because you know we focus a lot on the meaning of the cards but isn't it true also that the spread defines the answer that you're getting that it contributes to the meaning as well so what can you tell us about spreads like your favorites the most i'm interested to hear this yeah um i uh, i have two particular ones that i use quite a lot and I have to uh, give acknowledgement back to my original teachers and it's like they've stood the test of time. Um, One I use is called the life spread and I've modified it slightly but it's where um, you have, uh, you look at the person's thoughts, their feelings, their spirit and their health as the central cards and then spread around that as a sort of outer circle. I look at home, work, love and money. And so, of course, that's a great reading because it covers so many of the things that most people are going to ask about, particularly if someone says, oh, I just want a general reading. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's that's a really good core spread that I use. Um, the other one is just using major arcana uh, cards. And I often do this one initially where I've got a longer time with the person <coughs> just take the major arcana cards. I usually have a separate deck for those 
and um, uh, where we look at it's just five cards and where you look at where's the the major energies coming from in the past uh, what's happening in the present where's the future going the person's personality and the environment around them and that card I find is that spread is very very powerful and inevitably there's a card at least if not more from the, that initial spread that end up in the life spread that I mentioned um, initially. And then the other one I use is called the horseshoe spread and um, it's where uh, it's where someone has got a really specific, more complex issue. Uh, often I use I might use the, the major arcana spread first, then the life spread um, and then move into the horseshoe spread to get down to drilling down into a specific issue so that spread covers um the past the present influence a hidden influence then an obstacle the environment around the person um the action they need to take and the outcome Mm. and that can often you know can take a while to work through but often gives a, a huge amount of insight and then of course as many of us use you know clarifying cards around cards that might be a bit ambiguous or where we need to get more clarity around it right right so this, the general idea is to assign categories you know this card is going to mean in this, x. yes in this particular position yes right and not change it once you've decided that it's going to mean x it remains x and, yes, and yes. then going from there now i want to remind everyone that these extremely useful and illuminating spreads are just a few of the many that are in our toolbox oh. if you want access to more if you have a problem and need a consultation or if you'd like to learn more of these spreads and these techniques you can find a list of her courses at globalspiritualstudies.com slash tarot slash Jenny Perlstein you can also contact her at tarotastrocounseling.com.au so Jenny this has really been an extremely informative uh, uh, hour for myself. I especially uh, like the live spread. Can you tell us a little bit about you know some of your courses where we could perhaps learn these spreads or learn some tips on being a better yeah. listener and counselor for our, our clients or loved ones? Yes. Um, the uh, original course that I've, I've done both face-to-face for people in Melbourne, Australia, obviously, but I've also got the online courses um, is where I do one on counselling and mental health skills. And that's uh, 12 sessions altogether. Um, and that can be found on Global Spiritual Studies. And that's really the gives a, a huge foundation. It's not to make someone qualified as a counsellor but really focusing in on a lot of the techniques that often people are already using you know you you you, we read body language for example automatically we're human (laughs) so but the course what it does it brings out things so that you're more conscious of them and you can use them more consciously and we cover everything from a lot of the things i've mentioned today immediacy um empathy and uh, all the different schools of psychology um, some Freudian stuff right through to relationship issues, mental health issues, um, and sometimes the challenging parts of working with clients. And then I've got these uh, shorter masterclasses that, again, I've sort of updated them from that um, more broad, uh, fuller course and looking at relationships, the secret ingredient to relationship readings, as well as one on difficult clients. Um, and also one on the relationship between tarot and counselling. So there's, there's quite a few that I've got um, at Global Spiritual Studies. And, of course, you can also go to um, yes, my particular website. If you'd like to receive my newsletter, for example, please go to that website, Tarot Astro Counselling. Counselling with a double L. We use the British spelling in Australia. That's right. Um, I forgot. Yes. Oops. Yeah. So just that little that little letter can make a difference. And um, you can go to that and you'll see the links to my Global Spiritual Study courses as well as um, all the other things I offer because I do tarot, astrology, I can do Skype readings um, and uh, and then I do, I, I speak at conferences. I've done some other USA radio interviews as well um, and, uh, and written articles and so on. So there's a whole rich um, uh, wealth of information there um, if you want to follow any of that up. 
I got to say, everyone, Jenny, we, we've 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 focused on the we flirted with the dark side tonight. We've been negative here. <laughs> I want to tell I want everyone to know Jenny is really a very engaging, optimistic, bright and sunny person. And I, I do believe she probably would have rather if we'd focused on the uh, the brighter side of life tonight. Uh, oh, no, that's, so, that's OK. I have a lot of Pluto and Scorpio in my astrology chart. So, you know, I'm quite familiar oh. with that deep, dark world. <laughs> oh, well, they say that's the mark of the healer right there. You Scorpio yeah, is a yeah. very healing type of energy. So you're definitely doing the right thing in life, I would, I would have to say. But yes. that is wonderful. I really appreciate you joining us tonight here on the Psychic Viewpoint and Definitely, it would be worth your while to visit terrorastrocounseling.com.au to learn more about Jenny Pearlstein. Jenny, thank you very much for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful day down under. Thank you very much, and a pleasure to have been on the program, Stephen. Thank you very much. Wonderful, wonderful. We'll see you next time for sure. Hello, my name is Res Miranda. If you're having relationship, career, or life issues, I'm inviting you to experience what it's like to have access to professional, highly accurate psychics and spiritual advisors you can trust to care and help you. Register now to get your free six-minute reading by telephone or chat. Get answers. Get access. Psychic access. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Psychicaccess.com. That it's um, a way of, of cleansing out themselves and their life and uh, letting go of some things that might uh, be challenging to them and that the devil card really is all about fear and by facing the illusion of that fear um, you can often confront uh, what's really holding you back and what's a deep challenge for you on that level. Um, often, I, you know, I think for many of us, the devil can represent things that are addictive, which can include, I think a lot of people don't recognise that, you know, relationships can be addictive, codependency. Um, it's not just your alcohol and drugs, it's food, it's... Um, addiction to being just with other people that you can't cope with being alone there's a whole range of, of aspects so um, I try to reassure people but it's also then um, trying to get across to them too that um, they have some resources within and often the card can pick up on that and you know for example the death card I'll go into the actual characters on the card and and say how is each person responding you know, to the the approaching um, death or change that might be occurring, and we explore that further. Wow. So that uh, oh, most of the time, people you can see the relief on their face <laughs> as I as I explain yeah. that, and they relax and and whilst they still need to, you know, it's not trying to take away that it's all um, lovely and and fluffy. Um, it's trying to get across to them, yeah, there are challenges and there might be pain and, and you're not going to change within unless you do have pain. Uh, right. But it's something they can cope with. They have the resources within to cope with. Well, you know, let's say that I'm doing a reading for a coworker. We're probably going to use the coworker a lot because I think that might be a general situation people might yes, use, maybe yes, a novice yes. might use. And yes. uh, a whole bu- there are a whole bunch of court cards in this. Let's say the coworker asked me perhaps a relationship question uh, or or even a question about their career. Uh, and there are a bunch of court cards in the spread. Though these can be confusing. How how would you approach these all those court cards? Yeah, people often get challenged by the court cards. Um, um, it's strange because I suppose I've never found them to be such a great challenge. Um, my approach to them is, um, as always, um, it's it's looking at them. For, you, you need to look at the overview of the of the reading. You know what cards are there? What's the question? What's the pers- What's the question the person's asking? And and just even just initially seeing how many court cards there might be. And if there's quite a few. The tarot is the star tonight. We have Jenny Pearlstein with us here. She's going to talk to you tonight about two things that are very important to us over here at Psychic Viewpoint. The tarot and trauma. All the bad stuff. Uh, The tarot is mysterious, powerful, life-changing. Trauma is just an ugly fact of life. But we hope tonight that by exploring the darker side of fate, 
that we'll accidentally find what it is we've been looking for all along, joy, peace, and comfort. So if you ever read tarot for yourself or your family or your friends, this show is for you. Jenny Perlstein is about to teach you how to recognize pain in the tarot and happiness and achievement in the tarot. You can find out more about Jenny at tarotastrocounseling.com.au. And I do believe we have Jenny with us tonight. Hi, Jenny. How are you? Good. I'm very well, thank you. It's good morning oh. for me. Good oh, evening good to morning. you. That's right. That's right. You're over there in Australia. Well, good morning to you. Well, well let's go ahead and, and get started here. You are a therapist, a licensed therapist with a bunch of academic uh, titles and degrees after your name. Really too, too many to mention here. There's just so many. So you're highly <laughs> educated and also a terrorist. So let's talk about the major arcana for a bit. Can you just tell us a little bit about some major arcana cards that you find? You. Then that often can represent that uh, both. It could be something within the person themselves, the, the, oh. the, the, uh, the asker or the reader, the client, the, sorry, the, the person asking the questions or the client. Um, but it could also mean an, another person. Um, but I suppose because I'm a tarot counsellor, um, I'm very aware of things like projection. So that, for example, say the King of Wands comes up and uh, you're, you're talking to a work colleague and they're, but they're asking about relationship and you might say, um, uh, this, uh, this is a person with charm and, and who's uh, assured of themselves and is very visionary, um, courageous and so on. And sometimes that can can represent and they go, oh, yeah, I think that describes the person I'm quite interested in. Mm -hmm. and, and then I try to reflect it back to the person and say, but what is it within you that is like that? Mm -hmm. And what are you projecting out onto this person that, you know, you're, you are feeling attracted to? So that's just an example of how I might work with the court cards but I do sometimes use them as very literal you know if they say that if I say is there a person that has these characteristics that's around in your life and sometimes they'll say no not that I'm aware of well then I focus on oh, some problems maybe with your clients or in general um Yes, the, I think that uh, there's a, there's a difference between what's a problem for the reader and what's a problem for the client when they see the cards come up. In fact, I was at a, a tarot con convention here in Melbourne at the weekend and as soon as the teacher mentioned, oh yes, the client's reaction to the death card or the devil, the whole audience, we all just went, yes, we know. <laughs> <laughs> um, clients so often see those cards and um, and jump ahead, you know, thinking, oh, it's going to be disastrous and so on. And uh, I think that that they're often challenges for the reader and the client. Uh, but uh, I think that um, you know the key things there, of course, are to say to people that it, it needs. It depends on the question. It depends on the context. It depends on the type of reading you're doing. Um, but getting the client to see that, as you will say, you know, it's okay. We get to that and um, reassure them and uh, and I often very simply say look death is about transformation and yes there might be some pain there might be some grief and loss and this may be the picking up on something that they've been through going through or a situation that might develop that way and um, I really try to get across to them 